Fathers who battered the mother are twice as likely to seek sole custody of their children as nonviolent fathers. Studies show that batterers have been able to convince authorities that the victim is unfit or undeserving of sole custody in approximately 70% of challenged cases. And then he um, started touching me in places. So um, I rolled over and he pulled me back over to the other side and um, he took off my nightgown and he started hurting me. I was little, like my brother was still in a car seat. So I was like three. Denial, like no way, no way. Not my child, Not no, he wouldn't do that. Beat me, yes, I'm thinking, but touch my daughter, no. He punched me in the stomach. Laura, her sister and two brothers, told of physical and sexual abuse by their father and stepmother. The judge refused to look at the pictures the children drew. The children remain in the custody of their father. It's just indescribable, you know, what you go through. I mean, it, it's like a disaster that never ends. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Suzanne, please. please. Suzanne, please, come here. This video shows Susie begging her mother not to make her go to her dad's house. Eventually, medical and psychological reports revealed that she had been sexually abused. She named her father as her abuser, but that didn't seem to matter, so today she lives with him. Before I had to surrender her, I called everybody that I knew that was a child abuse advocate. Everybody that I networked all over creation. I made phone calls all over the United States and um, talked to people, please tell me who can help. Somebody's got to help me protect this baby. The family court system did not. In fact, in all of these cases, the fathers retained custody despite histories of sexual abuse and physical violence. What's important for the public to understand is that judges absolutely, unequivocally, have got to be accountable for their behavior. This case number is 2001. Not every judge is like Judge Susan Carbon, who has made it her business to be up to date on the latest research. This research points to judges and court authorities favoring the father, even in cases of significant family violence perpetrated by the father. I hear more and more judges say, in my courtroom, we're going to do this. This is not that judge's courtroom. This is the public's courtroom. But the public can't protest what it doesn't know. And because they don't know what's happening in the family courts, across the nation, this is nothing short of a national scandal. Thousands of women are experiencing firsthand what happened to Kathy, Pam, and Elaine. I just feel that the men are so good at conning, planning, and just figuring out how they're going to win. Because to them, it's a war. It's a war. It's a game. It's a war. There is a war, but it's a secret war, a war that takes place behind closed doors in America's family courts where no cameras are allowed. It seems that in this country, if you beat your wife, sexually abuse your child, and then ask for custody, chances are you'll get it. This was something I didn't believe until I got together with a childhood friend, a woman who's a paralegal, and her attorney husband. They told me of their cases in the family court system, and I was shocked. I went home and did some research. I began to do more research, 
And what I found was that from California to Maine, this kind of thing was happening every day. And so I decided to do a documentary. I wanted to talk to the ex-husbands, to the ex-husbands' attorneys, to the judges, and the guardians ad litem in these cases. But only the women wanted to talk. And so what you will see is the women's side of the story. So now meet those women who have been guided through the maze of the family court system by a remarkable husband-wife team. We live across the street in the apartments and we work right here. Meet attorney Charlie Hoffheimer and his wife, paralegal Diane Hoffheimer. The two run a law firm in Virginia Beach, Virginia, that represents women only in divorce and custody cases. And because they think if children believe in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, then they cannot distinguish whether they've been sexually abused or whether they've witnessed violence. Diane, once a stay-at-home mother, has taken on the most disturbing cases, cases involving sexual abuse and domestic violence. I feel as if I witness an accident and there's people lying around on the ground and they're, people are ignoring them and I, it's as if I have no other choice because what happened is I went to work for my husband or with my husband and just doing mundane things and I kept running into people who said to me, do something Diane. And I got closer and I saw a pattern of things going on. And I don't know whether my husband was just sneaky and introduced me to all the people with the same story or whether it just happened that way. But over and over again, I kept seeing the same man with a different name doing the same things. And I saw the woman um, suffering in the same way. Diane noticed it was always the same pattern. It began with domestic violence, followed by allegations of child sexual abuse. It seemed, too, that all over the country, despite police reports and medical evidence which supported the abuse, judges were ignoring the evidence and awarding full custody to fathers. For Diane and Charlie, the rulings made absolutely no sense. These cases aren't always about truth. They're about evidence, and there's a big distinction in what you can get before a judge and what the truth is. We haven't run into a whole lot of not accepting the evidence. What we've run into is a lot of ignoring the evidence. So there will be evidence of sexual abuse. Typically, the judge will say, well, you know, it's apparent that this child must have been sexually abused. There's, you know, ample evidence that that happened. But you know, we know that this father didn't do it. What Diane discovered was a pattern. Men, often men with histories of domestic violence, would go to court with their attorneys and say the abuse never occurred. They would then file for custody of the child. This, in essence, was exactly what happened to Kathy. The first time I went into court on a spouse abuse petition was, I was by myself. I didn't have an attorney. I didn't think that I needed one because I called the police. I, you know, tried to get out of a situation that was potentially very violent for me. And um, I, I, at that time, I really thought that, hey, you know, the police came to my house. That house was tore up. You know, there were, I had called 911. I was trying to get help. Why did I need an attorney? You know what I mean? I can tell this to the judge. It's in family court. They're family friendly. They're supposed to help me. But they didn't help her. In fact, the judge in her case, a woman, did just the opposite. Then she said to me, she said, um, she said, your spouse abuse petition is denied and I'm granting the father joint legal physical custody, okay, with primary physical custody with the mother. Uh, Mr. Oh. is no longer required to abide by the, you know, protective order. And he can come to the house and pick up the baby on Saturdays and return her on Saturday evening. So I asked her, I said, well, Your Honor, I don't understand what happened. And she said, well, that's what happens when you go to court without a lawyer. 
She goes, smart people spend the money no matter how much, because I said, oh, I can't afford a lawyer. And she goes, well, smart people spend the money to come to court, uh, you know, because they know that it's important to have a lawyer. And she goes, and I'm a judge. I can't give you legal advice. And that was her attitude. And I was like, oh, my God. So I left then, realizing that somehow I had blown the, um, you know, somehow something had gone desperately wrong. It was only at this point that Kathy found the Hoffheimer Law Offices. Seeing the brochure for their community outreach seminar on divorce, called Second Saturday, Kathy sought Charlie's help. Then she met Diane. I remember when I first met Diane, I came into Charlie's office and she was my little guardian angel because I was going through so much hell and the system didn't work for me. And everywhere I went, there were these little brochures, you know, that said, you know, if you're a battered wife, you know, right outside the courtroom is <laughs> this brochure. If you're a battered wife, come, you know, do these things, you know, and, and I did all those things. Kathy's story began in 1991 and is still in the family courts, mainly due to her tenacity. Not satisfied with the court decision, Kathy took Suzanne to Arizona and tried to get a change of order. While she was there, Jay filed for joint custody ex parte in Virginia and got it. These ex parte hearings, or hearings done when only one side is in court, are a frightening and daily occurrence in family courts. The husband got cu two months custody, and when he got the two months, he ended up going in and asking for full custody, and he got it. And he got it on a day when the mother was in Arizona fighting to get jurisdiction out there, so she wasn't even here. Suzanne, please, please. Suzanne. Suzanne, please, come here. During the time that we were waiting for the appeal to pr be perfected and going through all the it, things took forever, the little girl kept crying and crying that she didn't want to go back with her father. And um, Kathy kept saying to me, you know, I, Diane, what do you think it is? Do you think it's just separation anxiety? Because she really doesn't know him that well and maybe she remembers that he beat me or do you think that he's just kind of scary to her? And I said, I don't know, Kathy. She says she absolutely, it's not like she just doesn't want to go. I mean, she really doesn't want to go. Here we go. Come on. I just can't be a party to this. And I said, well, you have to. You have to. So I said, maybe you should videotape it. Maybe the courts will see how bad it is. Kathy took Susie to medical doctors. They determined that there was vaginal stretching and a suspicion of sexual abuse. There are three medical reports that all show progressions. You know, two centimeters dilated, hymen intact, rash, you know, a serious rash, not like a mild rash, but a serious vaginal rash, hymen intact. And then a couple months later, the child complains of a sore bottom, and then guess what? No longer is the hymen intact. And that's natural for a two, three-year-old daughter? Kathy called her the therapist who had been seeing the child, the therapist called social services and the child was taken to social services and she told them what was going on and demonstrated with dolls and then they took her to Dr. Dietrich K immediately then so there wasn't any time lapse and there was evidence, physical evidence that matched what the child was saying and so Kathy called me from the doctor and she said, Diane, I'm so sorry it's true, it is happening but at least it's over. But it was far from over. The judge ordered an independent therapist to become involved, one who ignored the fact that the child had just disclosed sexual abuse. First thing this guy does, even though he knows she's been sexually abused, and he knows that the alleged perpetrator is her father, that Suzanne said it was her daddy, he puts her daddy in therapy with her and then questions her in front of her daddy about her sexual abuse. He was sitting there with Jay in the room asking Suzanne if she'd been abused. And Suzanne's going, stop, stop. And he's doing it that way. I mean, he basically has ruined the whole thing and protected Jay. This same judge, well respected in the community, refused to allow the tape of Susie's crying. She also refused to allow this picture which Susie drew, showing no arms, long legs, and a perspective which one psychologist believed revealed sexual abuse. She did, however, allow this Kathy cartoon, submitted by Jay's attorney, attempting to show too much attachment to the mother. I don't know how it all happened, but by the time we had the hearing, um, 
the father got custody. I had thought about leaving, but my mother was dying. I had three other children. And I just prayed, God, don't make me have to do this. You know, please, somebody somewhere has to be able to help. But no help came. Right before Kathy was supposed to turn Susie over to her father, Kathy and Susie secretly took off into the night. Two o'clock in the morning, I took my stuff and I packed my bags. I didn't even know where I was going to go, to be honest with you. I didn't even know. I had no money. And my income tax check came the day before, and I said, okay, God, here we go. Lead me, direct me, let's go. And we did. That was in 1994. For two years, Kathy and Susie lived underground happily and safely. Kathy was actually the first major custody case that we tried before circuit court judge. And Diane literally um, was bedridden by the result in, in the fetal position for three or four days or five days. I don't remember exactly how long. And when she came out of that state, and that's the only way I can express it, there burned in her soul a absolute commitment to the children of sexually in sexual abuse cases, and she has been unyielding. And unyielding is what Diane must be when she hears cases like Pam's. Once married to Jesse's father, Pam never dreamed that one day he would violently turn on her. When you get married, um, I, I always believe, you know, in that little fairy tale princess and you live happily ever after. And um, children, I wanted children. And um, I had got a beautiful daughter. Happily ever after didn't last long. Two days after our marriage, um, he started beating me, which really shocked me. Um, he was smashing my head on the sink. He had smashed it so hard, he didn't even realize how hard he was smashing me, but I couldn't even raise my arm. Many beatings followed, but it wasn't the beatings that made Pam finally leave. She said, um, Daddy put his body in my body, made me bleed, and I was like, what? Denial. Like, no way, no way. Not my child, not, no, he wouldn't do that. Beat me, yes, I'm thinking, but touch my daughter, no. He said, like, if you tell, I'll kill your mom. Despite her father's threat, Jessie did tell her mother. Physical evidence of the sexual abuse was determined. The father was registered as a sexual abuser in the state of New York. Pam was then warned by social services that she could lose custody of all three of her children if she didn't protect them from their father. Um, they counseled me on staying with him and that if she was hurt again that I would be prosecuted because I was not protecting my child. So Pam left with the three children and moved to another state. But the father filed for custody of the two boys in Virginia and got it. He did not apply for custody of Jesse, no doubt because of the New York ruling. So now the boys visit Pam only twice a year. After they returned, the boys had been saying that they were being beaten and um, that Sean had been burnt with a cigarette. And um, Aaron was talking about being cut with a I, I just, the way, the knife they described is like a wide knife, so it's like a butcher knife. One time we the marriage game and it touching me. When the boys told of other horrors, Pam decided to secretly tape a nighttime conversation. One son told her again about the marriage game they are forced to play with their father and stepmother. This tape was ignored by the first guardian ad litem, the children's attorney in the case, and so the judge never heard it. What's the matter? They touch each other in bad places. Who makes you? Touch who? Touch who? In your bad places. Who? They touch each other in bad places. Who does? They make us kiss. Touch who? 
You put everybody touching you, but other than your dad taking it. Not good. How can you award custody to a father who has sexually abused one of the children and has physically abused the other two? The boys described to social workers the abuse that took place with their father and stepmother. They also told Dr. Susan Garvey, the court-appointed psychologist who specializes in forensic psychology and family abuse. I publicly testified that it was my belief through my clinical evaluation of the two boys that they were sexually abused by their father. Even though it was a domestic violence situation, even though many of the child's therapists had said that, uh, that the children were sexually abused and were traumatized by the father, even though a psychological, a recent psychological on the mother said that uh, she was a fit parent, even though a recent psychological on the father said that he had significant psychological difficulties and that psychologist recommended only supervised visitation. Even though I said the children showed trauma and I believe their stories that they had been abused by their father, the judge gave custody to the father. The courts haven't been interested in the substance. Um, you know, what, what courts will do is they'll look at the evidence that says that the kids are being molested or the kids are in danger and disregard that. And then they look for any sort of a thread that arguably can suggest that the mother made it up or the mother did something wrong. And unfortunately, uh, lots of kids are being destroyed in the process. Richard Ducote, a nationally known lawyer and child advocate, has been brought in as co-counsel on the case. There's no law in the country that was ever written to hurt kids. There's no law that was ever enacted to hurt kids. If a law, or if the law, or if the system hurts kids, it's because judges misapply it. In this instance, the guardian ad litem arrived before Pam and her legal team. She spoke alone with the judge. Pam, who is paying for two attorneys, is used to this kind of legal exclusion. The guardian ad litem doesn't want to talk about what just happened. Later, she refuses a request to be interviewed, even though it is her job to listen to the boys, talk to both parents, and present a clear picture to the judge in fact, she has talked to the boys only briefly. She has ignored evidence of domestic violence and sexual abuse, as well as the audio tape. Pam, who had hoped for more visitation with her sons, was denied without ever being heard. I don't understand what happened. I don't know how they got removed. I obeyed the court order, and they took them anyway. I wake up every morning worried about my sons. I go to bed every night worried about my sons. But Pam has not given up hope. She has remarried. Glenn has inherited her legal and financial battle, which has spanned almost a decade. Jesse, now a poised young teen, and Glenn have watched Pam suffer from court rulings. When she goes to court, it's her right, and she should do it to protect her children. The court system is supposed to be there for that purpose. Social services and other child protection agencies are supposed to be there to help protect her children. So how can so many judges make decisions that are clearly harmful to children? Because they're fathers and they're so interested in their children and they want custody so badly, the judges are impressed. We have all these fathers who don't care about their children and heaven knows we need fathers. I mean, I would be the first to say that fathers are irreplaceable. But the judge thinks this is, this is one of these fathers because why would he be so interested in this child? And he doesn't get the reason that he's so interested in this child is because this is breaking this woman's heart and breaking her down. About 75% of men who are abusive of their partners are also abusive of their children. This, the, the kind of abuse is less clear, but I've seen many cases in which there's also been um, sexual abuse against the children. I think the common link 
is that men who are abusive of their partners are often men who are very controlling of other people and who have their way with other people. And if the way that they want to have is sex with a child, these are men who would be much less likely to be inhibited from having sex with a child than another man might, might be. Not surprisingly, even in the courts, women are judged on how they look. Dr. Carolyn Newberger has witnessed this time and again. I think that people often have a preconceived notion of what a man who batters should look like. And when he doesn't look like that, then the woman isn't believed. What I'd like people to know is that when women are abused, they don't come out of that experience looking like paragons. They come out of that experience distraught. They come out of that experience angry. They come out of that experience reactive. They come out of that experience sleep deprived. They come out of that experience with all kinds of symptoms and um, difficulties that need to be sympathetically and empathetically understood and recognized for what they are as reactions to a horrible reality. If you are the male in this relationship the, or the one exerting the power and control in this relationship, you often come across as very cool, calm, collected because you have been the one in control. I think it's important to understand the legal and social context of violence in families. Historically, back at biblical times and all the way through to English common law, which is the source of our law in the United States, women and children were literally property of their husbands and fathers. You carry that forward to the fact that we didn't have any concept of family violence, child abuse, or spousal abuse because women and kids were property, and you can't violate that which is your own. So for years, it was not until the uh, early 1900s that we had laws in every state to protect children from abuse. And we had shelters for animals before we had shelters for children. If women are perceived in court as unstable, angry, and vindictive, while men are seen as calm, controlled, and caring, it is no accident. It is part of a deliberate strategy devised by Dr. Richard Gardner. Dr. Richard Gardner is the father of PAS, Parental Alienation Syndrome. PAS means that children are programmed by one parent to say bad things about the other. He's a reputable doctor, even though he has a history of siding with the fathers while taking aim at the mothers. His work on PAS has become the meat and potatoes of most contested custody cases. There would be a transfer of custody if the mother can cease and desist from further PAS indoctrination. It's very frustrating because I know that I have saved many people from jail. I know that I have made important contributions with the PAS. You see, what you have there is, is a classic. Yes, think about it a minute. There is one person who has described a new disturbance, a new s disease, describing the causes, the development, the clinical manifestations, and the treatment and the prevention in one book for one disease. That rarely happens, and I've done that, and it's an important contribution. And I get a lot of shit thrown in my face because of it, but it's an important contribution. It's a contribution, however, that is most questionable. What a lot of people don't know is that almost all of Gardner's work on PAS is self-published. It is only on closer inspection of his entire body of work that one can see ideas that should cause alarm. Incest is traditional. Jews are at the root of the problem. Infants can have orgasms. Yet PAS, used to combat allegations of sexual abuse, is often accepted as legitimate theory. And on the face of it, PAS may look reasonable. But when it's applied in court, it's disastrous for the mother. Because if her child tells her of sexual abuse, there is no way she can win. Consider what Dr. Gardner says a good mother would do if her child told her of sexual abuse. What do you see? You, uh, you, you, sometimes you see, uh, I don't believe you. 
I'm going to beat you for, for saying it. Don't you ever talk that way again about your father. She tends, she, she uh, subscribes to the rule, believe the children. Children never lie. Well, everybody knows children lie. So what, all you have to do is say to the kid, listen, 11, or 13, 11 14, I'm not talking about five-year-olds. Uh, now look, you are fully responsible, and if you don't, you are in contempt of court, and you are in defiance of a court order, and the judge can put you in a juvenile dissension center. One afternoon, one evening, one weekend will cure the kid. I'm convinced of it. The same thing with an overnight for the mother. In, in, I'm not talking about uh, in, in Sing Sing, you know what I mean, or, or, or Rikers Island with hardened criminals. I'm just saying the county jail in a cell overnight will help her remember to get those kids. To just say, for the court to say, 5 p.m. Friday, they're at the father's house. 5.01, they're not there. He has a court order. He calls the police. The police are instructed by the judge to take her away for the weekend, put her in jail till Monday morning. Or she's on house arrest. She cannot leave the house, and if she's out of the house, then she's arrested. She's in contempt of court. We will see in the next few years more and more people being put in jail for short periods of time uh, for inducing PASs to help them remember not to do it. And why is it now becoming possible? Because of this large burgeoning of PAS and also more men are now indoctrinators. So it's politically correct. It's okay to put a man in jail. You don't bring about the anger of women if you put a man in jail. And then that will make it easier to put women in jail for the same offense. That's what's happening. And that is what is happening. Even though many psychologists and doctors consider PAS a flimsy theory, it has nevertheless become fully integrated into the legal system. And fathers' rights groups, masquerading as children's rights activists, are now using PAS to change state and federal laws. And now the fathers have come out with um, making it a misdemeanor or a felony to even allege abuse if it's false. So what they're trying to do is be sure they close the mouth of anyone who will speak out. Online there are sites that tell the fathers or the perpetrators, if you are accused of abuse, this is what you need to do, A, B, C, D. Number one, apply for custody. On the father's manifesto, uh, become a patriarch page where you sign up. I printed off uh, uh, last summer, thank you for visiting the father's manifesto homepage to become a patriarch sign here. And it tells you where you can click on. After that, it's followed by, excuse my language, fuck all women and gabachos, fucking chili dogs. Sign me up. The reach of the Father's Rights Movement covers the state, the country, and actually the world. They go from family courts to the capitals to the United States Congress actually to world affairs, that they are a very pervasive organization and they have connected through the internet and that makes them very effective. The internet has been, um, it appears to have been a major force in what's happening across the world in child custody. And that's why now that the women are starting to use it too, that maybe we'll be able to get some balance here. The Internet is one of journalist Karen Winner's most powerful tools. Based in New York City, her website blasts the workings of the family court system as she exposes corruption across America. Her book, Divorced from Justice, documents judicial disasters in the family courts. When there is incontrovertible evidence, physical evidence, that a child is being sexually molested, it is inexcusable that a judge will not admit that evidence because it is the family court. And in the family court, the same rules don't apply. The judge meets with one side behind closed doors, and that's illegal, unconstitutional, it happens all the time, every day, throughout a lot of courts, and I'm not exaggerating. It happens because there's no scrutiny, because the media has decided to ignore the uh, 
hidden practices that go on in the family courts. Winner says there is no judicial accountability in the family courts. Ex parte hearings, hearings done when only one side is heard, are legal. Women may not know about a court date or think that if they don't show up, nothing can happen. But plenty does happen. When a woman calls me and she says she's about to lose custody, her child is being molested, the guardian ad litem is on the father's side, the judge is um, already made his decision even though there's really no, there's no trial that's taken place and it's a fait accompli that she's going to lose custody. I don't know what to tell her. I really don't because her fears are correct. I think what an adorable little boy <laughs> I had. This is Elaine. She's been in a never-ending battle to get her four children back. Each child has said that their father and stepmother sexually abused them. Now married to Bill, Elaine has a new baby. But her torment began years ago when her four other children came for a visit. The kids were always a handful from the beginning, but nothing really bizarre or terribly unusual happened until they had been in the custody of their father for several years. And we picked them up in um, Asheville, North Carolina, and on the way home, uh, the two youngest children were trying to have oral sex in the back of the car. And right then and there, No, it's okay, it's right. Um, we knew that something was going on. Elaine immediately got her children to a therapist. There they told of extensive physical and sexual abuse at the hands of their father and stepmother. He punched me in the stomach, and it had scars from that. And he beat me with this, um, this big fence post. It was like this wide and this thick and this long. All four children told Child Protective Services about their abuse. They drew explicit pictures of life with their father. In several different states, they told therapists of extensive abuse. At one point, desperate to keep her children from her ex-husband and waiting for legal support, Elaine tried to prevent her children from returning to their father. She was arrested for parental kidnapping. Even though a Virginia court found her innocent, Another family court judge ignored the children's pleas and the evidence so the children remain with their father. Who can they trust? Who, do they, who can they believe will help them now? When he took the children after there had been disclosures here in Virginia and everybody here believed that these allegations were going on, when he took them to Tennessee, um, he had a hearing there, an ex parte hearing, where he um, said that these allegations were false. I had coached the children and programmed them. I was never allowed to be there. I was never served. I never knew it was happening. Um, I was never, I didn't have an attorney there. I wasn't there. His side was the only side that was heard, not mine. And, be, and out of that, he got an injunction against me, and it's almost two years now where I have not been allowed to have any kind, I can't even send my children a birthday card. I can't even call them. Um, and he's the one with the record of the child abuse. <laughs> I, I have had one incident of supervised visitation in this building in, in, in Tennessee where he lives, where um, they have guards and they have locks on the doors and the guards have guns and they have two or three people supervising the visitation because you know usually it's criminals and I have no criminal history I have no history of child abuse either but yet I have to have all these people there to make sure I'm not going to hurt my children in the ultimate assault Elaine was ordered to pay child support it's like a disaster that never ends because we have seen that justice goes to the highest bidder. 
But it keeps, it, it uses this as, as a pattern. It's, it's, it's this one, it's that one, just keeps us in court, keeps us uh, in, in legal fees. It's just like the old thing, keep them barefoot, keep them in the kitchen. Now what they do is keep them in the court, keep them poor. And poor is what Elaine is today. She paints portraits. Bill is a technical writer. Together, there is no way they can pay the tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees. In these cases, it's all turned around to, to the mother is crazy. And, and if the mother's not crazy by the by time it's all over, uh, then that in itself is a miracle. Charlie, have you got um, Carter in the morning? It's late, but as usual, Diane and Charlie are still working. A 16-hour day is the rule, not the exception. And often the stress is overwhelming. Diane finds solace in the Quaker meeting, the church where she grew up. Several years ago, Kathy would join Diane and her parents. That was before Kathy and Susie fled to California. Diane didn't know about Kathy's life there, but Kathy was safe. Susie had a bike and toys and friends. And then one day they were discovered. Susie was put on a plane. The police put Kathy in handcuffs and took her away as Susie watched. Kathy was thrown into jail. I was forced to room with people that I would never say a word to in my life. I would never, we would, our lives, our, <laughs> our paths would never have crossed, okay, had it been for different situations. I was incarcerated with people that killed their children. We've created a whole new class of criminals, and that's mothers who are protecting their kids. And it's got gotten so crazy that those mothers actually have bail three and four times as high set for them as do the men or other women who try to kill their children. Brought back to Virginia for a trial, Kathy was big news. A fugitive in chains, her first call was to Diane and Charlie. She needed a criminal lawyer this time. Charlie got her Tom Shuttleworth, pro bono, for free. I thought after looking at the materials that were provided to me by, uh, by Diane and Charlie that she was being treated unfairly by the system. Um, not anybody in particular, I didn't think, but just the system. And I thought she was falsely accused. Uh, straight with juvenile court. I think we kind of had a three-prong uh, attack or defense. There was some pretty strong evidence that the child had been molested. My opinion of the way the father presented was he didn't present very well. He looked, it, in my opinion, creepy. And the Commonwealth had, a, uh, had an expert witness that I think was horrible. He testified in this case that he'd reviewed all the medical records of the child, all the psychiatric reports of the father, and it was his opinion that the father didn't molest the child. Well, we also had from him past testimony in another case, which was reported in our Supreme Court reporter, that he had rendered an opinion that it was okay for a father to have sex with his stepdaughters um, if he was from a particular foreign country and, and, and that, was, that was part of their culture. Which again, um, I don't, I mean, if this is going on HBO, then I would say this is bullshit. <laughs> if, it, if it's going on, uh, you know, public TV, it's malarkey. And we were able to prove that. I think the jury, I mean, I, you could feel a chill in the air when that guy was on the stand and the jury found her not guilty of, of, of stealing her child or kidnapping her child, I guess is the technical term. Um, I think probably 10 times out of 10 juries would find her not guilty of that. It was frustrating to know that we had won this great victory in a criminal case and that she was free and out from under the threat of going to prison and, and the threat of further prosecution and, and what have you, while at the same time she still didn't have her child back and I was very frustrated about that. So was Kathy, but she, with the help of Diane and Charlie, devised a new strategy to go pro se, which means that she would be her own lawyer. This would normally be a dangerous thing to do by yourself except that Kathy had Diane to guide her through the process. With her hotel room as an office and her suitcase filled with records of her child's past, Kathy is determined to have her day in court. I also want this judge to hear me speak. I want to be up, 
And I don't know if maybe it's something that I need to do for me. You've got some time now. Call McBride. Call. Lieutenant Wade McBride was the supervising investigator in her custody case. But convincing him to testify isn't easy. With no money, no drop-off and delivery for subpoenas, Kathy is operating with one hand tied behind her back. They told you that? Because I, sp I specifically sent them a letter saying to the clerk's office, and I have a copy here somewhere, but I specifically, with the subpoenas, I sent them the money and I said, please call Lieutenant Wayne McBride. He will come by and pick up the subpoenas for him and Investigator Dutcher. They didn't notify you. Lieutenant McBride. I know, I know that, okay. I know that you're on vacation. Okay. It's tomorrow morning. Can you please be there? Oh, please, God, please be there. Okay, okay. I want you to testify exactly the same things that you testified in my criminal trial. That you investigated my daughter's sexual molest. Okay? That, but you did. You were in charge of the investigation. Thank you. Okay, then say, I supervise the investigation. Is this case still open? Well, why can't you take your file with you? But can't you sign it out just for court? Please? Okay, look, this is real easy. This is real easy. We don't, we, this is real easy, okay? All I'm going to ask you is this, okay? Were you the supervisor in the sexual abuse division of the Norfolk Police Department? Yes or no? And was not your primary suspect? Well, the only suspect. Okay, but did you have any other suspects? He was the only person named as a suspect. Thank you, Mr. B He's the only person that you recall as ever being named a suspect. Thank you, Lieutenant McBride. I'm going to call Dushu right now. Will you see me in court in the morning, please? Judge Shockley's courtroom 2, Circuit oh. Court, Virginia Beach. 9.30. 9.30. Today is the first day of Kathy's three-day hearing. Jay, Kathy's ex, walks in with his attorney. The guardian ad litem, Susie's attorney, follows. In what can only be described as sweet revenge, Kathy will get to cross-examine her ex-husband on the stand. Detective McBride is there, as well as Susan Avery the psychologist to whom Susie originally disclosed her abuse. She hopes today that the judge will finally listen to information that was originally presented in court, but ignored. I am not the only one who believes that the child was molested by her father. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I believe it. The, uh, the original uh, investigating social worker believed it. Her supervisor believes, believed it. The detective that interviewed her believed it. So, I mean, there were a whole bunch of people that believed it. Um, come on, go, go ahead in, Mr. Nelson. Where's Diane? Because this is family court, no cameras are allowed in the courtroom. Anyone who might be called to the stand may not listen to other testimony. So Kathy's family and Jay's family must wait outside the courtroom to be called. Pam, here to offer support, has seen the polarization of the two sides in her own case. It's like a tug of war. That's what it is. It's a tug of war. And it's the law you're tugging with, not actually the other parent. It's the law. You're tugging war with the law. I gave it my all. <laughs> While custody is what Kathy wants, what she gets is unsupervised visitation just for the weekend. The hearing is continued until Monday, but for the first time since she was jailed, Kathy may see her daughter without supervision. The ruling infuriates Jay. After the judge retired to her chambers, his attorney and the guardian ad litem witness his outburst of rage, but the guardian ad litem does nothing. You know, it, it, you could see it happening right in there. I don't understand why her attorney doesn't have any red flags going up. I don't know. 
I'm very excited the way Kathy's put this case on. I think that she has done a terrific job. And the judge has got to respect this mother as a caring mother and as a mother who really has her act together. And as a result, I think that um, the most important thing is that she's done a great presentation. Uh, it's very obvious that this father has not been doing the types of things that he should be doing with this child. And it's pretty obvious to me anyway that um, whether, I don't know that the judge is going to change custody, but I do think that the visitation arrangement is going to be changed. I think it would be a, a shame and a sin not to change the custody, but um, my reading of this judge is such that I still don't think that she's going to change custody. But Charlie's prediction comes to pass. Kathy doesn't get custody. She does get more than she had before, the right to have her daughter for one month out of the year, without guards, without supervision. But the message to Kathy is the message to all women. Whether you have high-priced attorneys or go it alone, if you bring up sexual abuse in just about any family court in the country, you will almost always lose. As soon as you bring in an allegation of child sexual abuse, you all of a sudden raise the norm beyond preponderance of an evidence, beyond clear and convincing evidence, and you almost get to a criminal standard beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, if you cannot cross the bar and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he abused, which is a criminal standard, then all of a sudden it's the mother's fault if with domestic violence and child abuse we can say publicly it is no longer acceptable to abuse your children, it is no longer acceptable to abuse your spouse, we have to stop. This is a crime. It's not just morally wrong. It is a crime and we need to stop it and we need to hold offenders accountable for their behavior. I think the thing that's so sad to me is the courts are, are being, um, they're buying into it not because they're stupid but because these men are so good. I truly think there are some excellent, intelligent judges who make very wise decisions on a daily basis. But it's whole, these men are so good because they have spent their life fooling people. Family court judges sitting without juries have broad discretion in considering the best interests of the children. Many judges can and do make good decisions. But when they don't, there's not much individuals can do. Judges think that fathers have a right to their children no matter what they do. Uh, there's a justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court in an oral argument who said, I don't get it. Just because you molest your child, you lose visitation. If you go, you know, molest a child next door, you will be dealt with severely. But if you grow your own victim, then, you know, it, that's sort of excusable. In other words, it's okay to molest your own children, just not other people's. So mothers like Elaine, who must see their children under armed guard, must somehow help them hold on. If there's any way that this can get to my children, my four precious children in Tennessee, I just want you to know that I love you and that I have not stopped trying to help you. And I do believe that the truth will eventually come out. The way things stand now, the only way the truth will come out so that the system can change is when abused kids like Jesse go public with their stories. The judge in Newport News would not even listen and told me I couldn't even remember. But I can and it hurts a lot because I'm scared for my brothers. They are now living with my father out of state. So everybody needs to listen to us kids. Everybody kept telling me, lawyers and um, Marty and my family members and my friends, don't talk about it, you know, you're, it's shameful. Um, and that's what kept my mouth shut is the don't talk about it. The judges were threatening me, you know, don't, talk, don't come in here again in my courtroom or you'll lose all rights to your sons. I mean, that's a pretty drastic thing to be telling a mother who hadn't done anything to her children. Um, 
but don't quit talking. Keep talking, because you will be heard someday. I tell her every day, don't stop, Pam. Keep going forward. Don't stop. Don't go backwards, because somebody will listen. Somebody will do something. If not today, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, the next day. There's always another day. There's always another opportunity. When people do start to listen, it will be because of the work of people like Diane and Charlie Hoffheimer. They do believe that there will soon be a trail of truth, blazed by the voices of the children, like this poem by Susie, which Diane discovered stuffed into a corner of Susie's school desk. To my mom, to a dear and beautiful mom who is always by my side, I wish that you could stay all my life today in every way on this Thursday. I love you, Mom. I wish that you could stay. I love you <laughs> in every way. I just wish that you could stay and see me on this Sunday. What touches me the most is how much it touches the mothers because I'm hoping and praying that the children can hold on to the ability of their mothers to rescue them at some point. One mother who has fought to protect her children has a saying that a child's soul is murdered by sexual abuse and that a society's soul is murdered by allowing the child to be re-abused. I know that one day the court will get it. One day the children are going to be awarded to the parent or even to the non-parent who nurtures the child and keeps the child safe. And when that day comes, society will regain its soul. Jay was convicted of assault and battery of his second wife after smashing in a windshield of the car containing his wife, her mother, and his two young daughters. He was also found guilty of threatening to kill a friend of his wife with a baseball bat in a McDonald's parking lot. Despite these incidents of violence, the court awarded Jay temporary custody of the two small daughters, but ruled that he must attend anger management classes. After Jay appealed the second conviction, he got custody of his two youngest daughters, as well as Susie. Elaine has made repeated efforts to visit her children without supervision, but has been thwarted at every turn. Elaine is now allowed to call them twice a week. Pam Spiggle's advocacy team, made up of Diane Hoffheimer, Charlie Hoffheimer, and Richard Ducote, joined by Justice for Children in an amicus curiae brief, and with the benefit of special counsel for the two boys, was awarded sole custody of her sons. The children testified in open court. The court awarded full custody to Pam and ordered no contact with the father unless recommended by the children's therapist. The children have had no contact with their father since the hearing. 